just want to thank you all for coming today. Um, my name is Jean Soika. I work here at PVMA. Um, I work here at PVMA, and this project is sponsored by the Massachusetts Humanities Expand Massachusetts Stories, or projects that collect, interpret, and share narratives about the Commonwealth with an emphasis on voices and experiences that have gone unrecognized or have been excluded from public conversation. Um, I had my DNA done, and I'm 100% Eastern European, and so this is obviously a great passion of mine. Um, after writing the grant, Sheila Dan Fuller, um, great exhibit designer, helped me put my vision to life, and the exhibit opened at the Discovery Center in Turner's Falls. It traces the imprint stories of two Eastern European families, the Skibiski family, um, and their journey in farming, and the Soika family, which is mine, in Turner's Falls, as they came to work in the factories. Um, through photographs, artifacts, it chronicles their journey from Poland and Ukraine to the American colonies and their lives here. Despite the many challenges they and other Eastern Europeans faced, they thrived here while making vital contributions to the growth and development of the Connecticut River Valley farms, factories, and civil life. I want to say a special thanks today to Alan White and Pam Hodgkins, and also to Carol Kostecki, Susan Urban, the Polish American Foundation from Connecticut, and the Polish Genealogical Society of Massachusetts. And we also have some breads and cookies for sale from Bernard's Bakery in Chicopee. And if there are any cookies left, the Kolachki cookies were made by the culinary arts students at Franklin County Tech School. Um, we do want to acknowledge the native people who first were in this beautiful valley. They hunted, fished, and cultivated and stored this beautiful land. And later, many other immigrants came to live and forever changed the landscape. And we want to say thank you to all of our generous sponsors and donors who gave um, wonderful store prizes over there. I'm especially eyeing the vegetable basket from the Galanka Farm in Waitley. And um, many people had made financial contributions as well, so thank you. This also is part of an exhibit that's open at Memorial Hall Museum. You can cross the lawn and look at that. Um, we're open till 4.30. You can check out the farm equipment on the front lawn. It was very generously lent by the Galinsky family. There's a corn sheller and a potato scale. And you can see what life was like for those very early immigrants. Um, the exhibit will then travel to the Holyoke Heritage State Park from December 7th through January 26th, 2025. So getting back to today, um, we are so thrilled and honored to have Dr. Patrice Dabrowski from the Ukrainian Harvard Institute, and she is going to speak on why leave Central and Eastern Europe, that is the foreigner Polish lands for America between 1880 and 1920. Her presentation will provide background on Poland and its fate, as well as explain what life was like in this part of Europe for many of our inhabitants. Um, we'll consider the reasons why people, our ancestors, were willing to leave everything they knew behind to travel across the ocean and strike out on their own in the new world. Um, Dr. Dabrowski has a PhD in history from Harvard University, and she is currently a Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute associate, a member of the board of directors of the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences of America, and the editor of H. Poland. She's the author of three books, The Carpathians, Discovering the Highlands of Poland and Ukraine, Poland, The First Thousand Years, and one of our door prizes is an autographed book by her, and um, commemorating of modern Poland. In 2014, she was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland, Poland and she was the recipient of the Mary Zirin Prize, awarded annually by the Association for Women in Slavic Studies to an independent scholar. Her Carpathians book won two Polish awards, and she continues to study and write about the Carpathian Mountains. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jean, for that wonderful and extensive introduction. And uh, my apologies to all of you who've been waiting so long here, but I'm thrilled to see so many people here in Deerfield on a beautiful sunny day. You could be outside and you're here for my lecture, so I appreciate it and thank you for coming. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay. So, 
why did so many people from Central and Eastern Europe leave for America between 1880 and 1920? My talk today will provide some background history on the Polish lands and their fate, as well as explain what life was like in this part of Europe for its inhabitants. We'll consider the various ways in which uh, and why people, your ancestors, were willing to leave everything they knew behind to travel across the ocean and strike out on their own in the new world. Now, let's get these slides moving here. Yes. Back then, they left the Russian Empire you see in brown there, or the German Empire, which you see there in purple, or the Habsburg province of Galicia in Austria-Hungary, which you see there to the south in the orange color. There was no Poland, right? Uh, you can just check the ship's manifest or their personal documents to, to see where they were written down as coming from. But many of them called themselves Poles. So let's step back and think about how that happened. A little over a century earlier, at the end of the 18th century, the biggest state you've probably never heard of, or, although in this case some of you have heard of it already, I know, ceased to exist. This was the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It dates 1569 to 1795. In its heyday, as you see here, the largest polity uh, in continental Europe. It encompassed the territory of today's Poland and Lithuania, to be sure, but also Belarus, most of Ukraine, as well as parts of Latvia and Russia. As you may imagine, this was no nation state that we're talking about. Such things didn't exist back then, but rather an ethnically and religiously heterogeneous entity. Religions in the Commonwealth included Roman and Greek Catholicism, various Protestant sects, Judaism, even Islam. So this part of the world was full of diversity. The country had also been an oasis of religious tolerance, a state without stakes, as historian Janusz Tazbir called it. Where elsewhere there were religious wars, from the very beginning of the Commonwealth's existence, they had agreed to keep the peace religiously and not persecute people for their beliefs. Politically, the Commonwealth also stood out from its European neighbors. First, it was a republic composed of two halves, the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And each of these itself was diverse in composition. Let's break this down by estate, which was the salient category back then. There were three estates, the nobility, the townspeople, and the peasantry. Now, the nobility, which was some 8 to 10 percent of the population, comprised the political nation. Nobles had the right to elect the king. There was a Senate and House of Deputies, which enacted legislation and kept the powers of the king in check. The nobles cherished their privileges, the so-called golden freedoms. Some were incredibly rich, richer than some kings in Western Europe, while others were impoverished, living more like peasants than nobles. Polish history is often told from the point of view of the nobles and royalty. Tales abound of dynasties and deeds. Another 10% of the population, or thereabouts, were urban dwellers, townspeople, burghers. They had their own rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Towns either belonged to the king, that is, those are the so-called royal towns, or they were the property of some noble, and those were the private towns. As regards the latter, these privately owned towns were generally populated by Christian burghers, some of whom also farmed if that wasn't their primary occupation. 
and also living in private towns was much of the Jewish population. Many Jews were in the employ of the town's noble owners who leased various things to them, such as mills, taverns, or breweries. Towns are where most trade took place in the Commonwealth. And last but not least, we have the villagers, the rural dwellers, the peasants. It is in villages where the bulk of the population of the Commonwealth, some 80% lived. In the Commonwealth, peasants were serfs owned by the lords, and they labored in the lords' fields or otherwise served the lords. The peasant's life was hard, and I'll say more about this later. The old saying had it, the commonwealth was heaven for the nobles, purgatory for the townspeople, hell for the peasants, and paradise for the Jews. Why so? We should note that the Jews had escaped persecution in the west of Europe. Not only had they been accepted in Poland and Lithuania, they came to play important roles within the Commonwealth's economy. At any rate, such was life in these lands until the end of the Commonwealth. In the last third of the 18th century, the Commonwealth, which many people still referred to simply as Poland, was dramatically and dastardly partitioned by the country's three powerful neighbors, Prussia, Russia, and Austria. The Polish Republic was unable to defend itself in the face of the so-called enlightened despotisms with their much larger armies. In three concerted moves, and here watch the maps, 1772, 1793, and 1795, increasingly more Commonwealth territory was bitten off by the partitioning powers. As of 1795, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was no more. People who had lived all their lives in the Republic now found themselves subjects of emperors and czars. Their new rulers impo imposed new obligations and restrictions on their new subjects. Many of these saw fit to rebel even before the final partition of 1795 had been proclaimed. If you've heard the names Kościuszko and Puaski, you will know of some famous Poles who did rebel against foreign oppression. But those two also happened to make their way to the United States and fight in the War of Independence on the side of the Americans. So they were among the earliest immigrants, if I may say so. Uh, some Poles from other estates, townspeople, peasants, and Jews, also joined in the fight. In the 19th century, more uprisings took place, practically one in each generation, after which there were waves of immigration, mainly to Western Europe, though, especially to France. Many emigres were nobles, but there were also regular soldiers from the lower classes who ended up in the West. Fast forward to the late 19th century, the period of concern for the masses of people who sought to emigrate to the United States. I'll focus on the period beginning in the 1880s, but let me simply note for the record that immigration to the, the United States from this part of the world started earlier than that. An early Polish settlement ended up being established in 1854 already in Texas, in a locality named Panna Maria, after the Virgin Mary. Those were emigrants, a whole parish full of them, that came from under Prussian rule. So from the purple side over there, I think maybe they came from Silesia, part of that country, all the way to Texas. But let's leave these Texans aside and focus on the bulk of the migration. The 1880s were the beginning of mass immigration from this part of the old world to the new world. Here it helps to understand something of the major changes taking place in the 19th century. Changes to state organization, 
social structure, and other factors that prompted Poles and other inhabitants of these lands to leave their homes and travel across the ocean. First, a few words about each of the empires in which the descendants of the Commonwealth's diverse population found themselves living. Under German rule, or Prussian rule, German rule, I'll use them as interchangeable here, that is the purple territories in the west and the north, peasants were emancipated from serfdom the earliest, in the beginning of the 19th century. But the Jews who had lived in those territories were treated differently. Poorer Jews were expelled eastward, while richer Jews were allowed to remain and encouraged to assimilate to German culture. At the outset, relations between Germans and Poles were not bad. Agriculture and industry made strides. But things got significantly worse around and after the mid-19th century. As the German lands were becoming united into one German empire, which was established only in 1871, Catholics and Poles were increasingly persecuted and discriminated against. This was under the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who initiated the so-called Kulturkampf, a culture war. Not only were schools to teach regular subjects only in the German language, even religious education was to be conducted in German, leaving Catholic Poles to worry that their children would be taught Protestantism. Polish priests at this time were fined and jailed. It was not a good time to live under German rule. Now, under Russian rule, that is these vast brown territories in the center and the east, the situation went from better to worse. Initially, the Russians left their new lands in peace, allowing life to continue there as it always had. The territories under Russian rule consisted of the lands farthest east, as well as the core Polish lands, which you can see sort of jut out into the purple there, right? Uh, which in the early 19th century had had semi-autonomous existence, first as a Napoleonic puppet state, and then as the Kingdom of Poland. The kingdom, however, was ruled by the Russian Tsar, who was King of Poland. I must tell you that the royal crown did not suit the Tsar of all Russia very much. Used to greater freedoms and self-rule, Poles in the kingdom eventually rose up against the Tsar, leading to mass emigration into Western Europe. Another uprising took place later in the century, which led to many Poles being sent in the opposite direction, to imprisonment and exile in Siberia. The administration of these lands and the schools were Russified, that said, there was some industrial development, especially in the textile industry, in the cities of Łódź and in Warsaw. And more importantly, the peasants of the region were finally emancipated in 1864. This is the last of the three empires to emancipate the peasants. And let me add one word here about the improvement of conditions for Jewish life in the 1860s in the Kingdom of Poland. As of that time, Jews could buy property from nobles, live where they previously had been forbidden to reside, and so on. Last but not least, under Austrian rule, that is here in the Orange territories in the south near the arc of the Carpathian Mountains, Thoughts of reform for the new province, known as Galicia, soon were abandoned. Under Chancellor Prince Clemens von Metternich, anything that smacked of Polishness came under suspicion. Poorer nobles who could not document their noble status were demoted to the status of peasants and treated as such. Yet, peasants were emancipated in 1848 during the so-called Spring of Peoples, 
This was a period all across Europe where, where various peoples rose up for their rights. Two years earlier, what had been the free city of Krakow, which if you can see right where those three different colors meet, there's a tiny little entity there. That's the free city of Krakow. It was demoted to the status of an Austrian garrison town. So it lost, it essentially was incorporated into Galicia at that time. This happened to happen after an, one of the, an, yet another abortive uprising in these lands. But with time, the political situation within Galicia improved. As of the 1870s, the province had been given a degree of autonomy. Schools could now teach in Polish and Ukrainian, for there were lots of Ukrainians in the east of Galicia, and Polish nobles and upper classes dominated the province, serving in its government and legislature, although there were lower class representatives as well. That said, the province was itself quite backward economically. There was little in the way of industry, except for the oil industry in the south and in the east. Galicia's rural economy was characterized by so-called dwarf land holdings. Most peasants had not received much land after emancipation to begin with. And with time, their land holdings became even smaller as they were subdivided among the sons, right? To make a longer story shorter, this made making ends meet much more difficult. It was increasingly hard for peasant families to feed their children. This same phenomenon would be found elsewhere in the former Commonwealth lands. Given the demographics, for families were quite large, this situation only got worse with time. So let's step back and consider some of the reasons why people of all stations might wish to leave. There were different reasons for different folks, of course. The various estates or classes experienced life within these empires differently and thus reacted to events differently. So back to the familiar slide here. Take the formal nobles of the Commonwealth who were used to self-rule and freedom. The loss of their country was a key reason for dissatisfaction. Many nobles took the loss quite hard. They were the ones who were organizing insurrections. So anything that smacked of anti-Polish politics simply ticked them off. But those who were wealthy could relatively easily pick up and leave for elsewhere in Europe unless their estates were confiscated by the authorities, which also happened after uprisings. Now for the townspeople and tradesmen. Towns that had been doing well under the Commonwealth did not always fare so well under foreign rule. Small towns could devolve to the status of a village if a population was not maintained. And could the population of a given town make a living? Remember that the 19th century was an age of transformation. Technology advanced. Some former means of employment became obsolete or at least did not pay as much as they once had. Let me give you one example. In the mid 19th century, railroads began to crisscross the region if they tended to connect to the imperial capitals of Berlin, Vienna, or St. Petersburg. Now in Galicia, these railroads also brought in cheaper goods from more developed parts of Austria-Hungary, such as the Czech lands. That had consequences for what little development there was and discouraged nobles from investing in such industries. Together with the partitions, the railway also put the river trade out of business. The Commonwealth had been a mighty exporter of grain, timber, and other raw materials back in the day, with flotillas of ships and rafts sent down the Vistula and other rivers all the way to the Baltic Sea, to the seaport of Gdańsk, where they were shipped further to Western Europe. 
Now, my own ancestors had been members of a guild of river captains. The captains were the ones who organized the flotillas. But with the advance of the railway, there was much less need for their services. Hence, many townspeople from my ancestral town of Ulanov ended up immigrating to the Americas. So you have me here. <laughs> Impoverished townspeople, as, whether, as well as others down and out, did on occasion expand the ranks of the working classes, at least in cities where there were factories. But new emigrants even there to the cities had it hard. Places like Warsaw were expensive to live. Lives were grim, and factory work was dangerous and difficult. For more on this, you could read Stefan Jeromsky's The Homeless in a wonderful translation by Amherst's own Stephanie Kraft. So you have a, a wonderful translator of Polish here in your midst. The upper classes seemed generally indifferent to the suffering of the masses, but likely this is true most anywhere. I don't know how many impoverished workers could earn enough money to emigrate. Borrowing was hard unless someone had collateral, for example, land or livestock. At best, they could revolt, but such riots were generally put down with overwhelming force. Another urban push concerned the Jewish population of these lands. In 1880, pogroms broke out on the territory of today's Ukraine. A pogrom likewise broke out a year later in Warsaw. Many Jews lost their property or even their lives, which encouraged others to move west, many all the way to the United States. It turns out that the victims had been met with little sympathy as stereotypes of Jews abounded. Although there was plenty of poverty among Jewish communities in the former Commonwealth, Jews were still traditionally traders and craftsmen, shopkeepers and moneylenders. One could find wealthy Jewish industrialists and destitute rag pickers, the whole gamut. In these various roles, Jews sometimes came into conflict with other social strata. Tensions and anti-Semitism rose precisely in the period that concerns us, beginning in 1880. Which brings us to the rural population, to the villagers. I'd like to spend the rest of my talk talking about them and their fate. They, after all, represented the vast majority of inhabitants of the region. Be they speakers of dialects of modern Polish, Lithuanian, Ukrainian, Latvian, or Belarusian, they all sh shared a similar fate. For centuries, they had been the Lord's serfs. They had been unfree people. Now, when historians write, or used to write the history of Poland, and I have to admit I'm no exception here, they tend to focus on the doings of the king, the nobility, the citizens of the commonwealth. The lives of peasants were for the most part overlooked, as if swept under the rug. Even the children of peasants were taught this history of kings and the nobility, the history of the Polish upper classes. But their own past is no longer ignored. In fact, there's a huge new literature coming out these days in Poland on what it was like to be a peasant or villager in Poland. And I'd like to share some of this literature with you so that you might understand why villagers may have been eager to leave their homeland on occasion. Now, peasants had long been exploited by their lords and masters a situation that worsened as time went on. Back in Poland's golden age, a third of what peasant households themselves produced went to the lord and master. By the 18th century, nobles extracted over 70% of the peasants' domestic production. It was nearly impossible for them to accumulate anything. So how did they react? They reacted with sullenness, cleverness, or they voted with their feet. In other words, they could be lazy, 
steal, sabotage work done for the Lord, run away to another Lord who offered better conditions. This would be the equivalent of later migrations because they were usually running from the west of the commonwealth into the east where there were fewer people and, few, and more hands necessary. Or in the worst of all cases, they could revolt. Relations between the upper and lower classes were, shall we say, strained. Lords treated their land stewards badly and the stewards took it out on the peasants. Violence on the part of land stewards and the lords, especially beatings and whippings, kept peasants in line. Still, historian Adam Leszczynski argues that serfdom in the Commonwealth, which can itself be thought of as an agglomeration of noble estates, somehow made economic sense to them. It was rational, if not humane, behavior on the part of the noble lords who sought to gain the greatest share of what was produced. Now, all this had repercussions even after serfdom, which as you now know, finally ended in this region in 1864, earlier under German and Austrian rule. First, the former serfs often needed to pay the landowner for whatever properties or land they were able to acquire. In gaining land, they often ended up losing rights to the commons, to pasture lands and forests, which had been a traditional right of the peasant. Many a peasant fought lengthy court battles to gain access to those forests and pasture lands, but only a few were successful. Still, in Austria at least, one could attend school in one's native language. Even a few peasants saw the rationale behind getting an education. For would education make one a lord or a lady? In 1880, the memory of serfdom was still very real. Plenty of former serfs were still alive, and their children and grandchildren learned of the hard lives they had led. Centuries of life under serfdom had shaped the peasant economy and mindset. In the words of one Galician peasant, this horror of serfdom has entered the people's blood in such a way that it still reverberates in them to this day, and not only among the simple people, but even among their sons who, thanks to education, now occupy high positions. The soul of the serf, the slave spirit, is in us, the peasants. And one should not romanticize village life as the painter Josef Helmoinski seemed to do on canvas here, although you have to admit he did paint the peasant girl's dirty feet. Nor did life look like this beautiful village of Zalipia with the wonderfully painted uh, interiors and exteriors. The peasant household of the 19th century was run like a business with each member responsible for contributing to its relative success. There was no room for softness or coddling. Only he who worked counted. Otherwise, the person was simply another mouth to feed. And most subsistence level households couldn't afford to keep such people. There were plenty of superfluous people in the villages, particularly children, and especially girls. Girls were more of an expense, as the family had to provide them with a dowry so they could marry, and they would end up leaving the house when they uh, grew up. In most cases, the sons would inherit land from the father, but there could be too many sons too, another reason to wish to emigrate. The latest scholarship on peasant life especially on peasant women, and there's a wonderful new book, probably this thick, on peasant women that's currently a bestseller in Poland, it makes for stimulating, if depressing, reading. Village life was hard from the very outset. Children were required to work from a young age. Three and four-year-olds were put to work cleaning their clothes, toys, their mother's and father's shoes, if they had any, 
to pass pieces of wood or potatoes and so on. Five and six-year-old girls were expected to help out at home. They swept the house, cleared the table, washed bowls, carried wood, fed the chickens, chased the piglet into the pigsty. Slightly older children would be responsible for tending the geese. And even older ones, like this girl here in the, in the picture, for taking the sheep or the cows out to pasture. Superfluous children, and here we have the case of orphans or half orphans as well, would be sent to work for more prosperous peasants, or in the case of girls, go to the cities to work as servants for the upper and middle classes. Many of them were 15 years old or even younger. While it could indeed be a step up to move into the urban space, sexual violence and unwed motherhood were rampant. And at age 16, girls were already considered to be of marriageable age. For all practical purposes, there was no such thing as marrying for love in these villages. Marriage was essentially a business proposal from one peasant household to another. A man had to have enough land to start a family, while a woman had to have enough of a dowry to be selected as his wife. And fathers, of course, had the last word in all of this. The daughter to be married off had no say at all. She was essentially treated like merchandise. And once married, if not before, she would essentially become a drudge, toiling long hours at home and in the fields. She had to labor like this regardless of whether she was expecting a child or not. Families tended to be large, so women carried a double burden, literally. It has been calculated that women, even those of the rural elite, so those who are the best off financially, worked 18-hour days. Men took the main responsibility of work in the fields and were the traditional head of the households. They also doled out punishment as they saw fit. The mother was responsible for what was considered women's work, all the work in the home, around the livestock, and the children. This included daily milkings of the cow, bearing and raising the children, cooking and keeping up the house, traveling to the market to make purchases of necessary items like salt or matches. Some prepared the flax and wove the linen for their clothing. Female villagers may not have been the main people to plant and dig up potatoes, pull weeds, gather stones, rake, tie up sheaves, and help with the harvest. That was supposed to be men's work, but women often also did such tasks. They also kept the barn in shape, put out hay, whitewashed the walls of the house three times a year, spread manure on the fields. A true picture of drudgery. No wonder that many women died early, died in childbirth, or saw their own infants or sickly children die. Widowers tended to remarry quickly, because they were unable to do everything their wives had done for them. Blended families crowded together under one roof. Stepmothers did not necessarily treat well the children from the husband's previous marriage. And still, peasant women considered inferior in status to men were simply pushed around. Another big issue was food security. Much of what was produced on the farms, such as eggs, chickens, cheese, as well as the mushrooms and berries that would be gathered in season, were sold in nearby markets. With the exception of most well-to-do farmers, peasants themselves subsisted on a diet of mainly potatoes. Potatoes, some flour, milk, cabbage, beans, and kasha. That was about it. Meat was consumed, generally, three times a year, at Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. Even children were rarely fed the milk, cheese, and eggs that would have kept them from getting rickets, as those were being sold in the market. They were perennially undernourished or malnourished. The data I have from the early 20th century paints a bleak picture. 
Now, in certain regions, progress had been made in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as seen from the memoirs of Galician peasant and village mayor Jan Swomka. He clearly was a rare literate peasant who noted the changes being made during his lifetime. Now, according to 1921 statistics, 40% of villagers were illiterate. There were newspapers directed towards a peasant readership. And you know peasants could gather in the evenings and some would read to them. So, not, so even those who couldn't read could still get some information. But they would learn from these uh, newspapers about agricultural best practices, about hygiene, and so on. Better equipment was to be had in the late 19th century. There were better roads and railroads. Swamka even purchased a clock which was a sensation in his village. Still, even this village mayor realized that if he dressed like a peasant outside his village, like he is in this photograph, he would be treated like a peasant, at best looked down on, or at worst, treated badly. But the prosperous Swamka was an exception to the rule. While he may have been making money, too many peasants struggled to make ends meet while still having to pay taxes. According to historian Adam Leszczynski, many peasants emigrated simply so as not to die from hunger. Now, they may have been treated like cattle en route, because we all have our images of steerage in the ships, right, what that looked like. But emigration was not as dramatic as those back home who fought to keep the peasants from emigrating argued. Three quarters of those emigrating from the Polish lands went to the United States. And time started to get better for them after emigration. Paid work abroad usually was much better paid, even many times more than work in the old country. In the new country, they were treated with greater respect and became more self-assured. Of course, some emigres went only for a spell, that is, to earn enough money to buy land back home. But others emigrated permanently, and I suspect many of you here are their descendants. Now, some immigrants may never have gone back, even if they had previously intended to, given the political upheaval and devastation that revolutions, wars, and border changes brought. Already during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1906, Poles rose up in opposition to the regime. There were agricultural strikes then, as well as in early 1918. Many protesters in that period ended up fleeing the Russian Empire, some settling in Galicia, but others doubtless went further to the West. And let's not forget the Great War, World War I, which began in the summer of 1914. The Eastern Front ran right through the former Commonwealth lands, wreaking devastation on many in a state, town, and village. Many had to flee their homes, spending the war as refugees. Some never returned to their former homes. Disease, and here you may recall the deadly Spanish flu, devastation and uncertainty were other reasons to emigrate, even if some may have been happy that the war led to the reestablishment of a Polish state. For in 1918, the Second Polish Republic came into being. While not all the territory that had been part of the Commonwealth was regained, the country did fight to obtain significant borders. Now, there's a lot more I could say about this and about the fate of minority populations in the New Poland. What I do need to say is that there were peasants who feared that the return of Polish rule meant serfdom would return. Now, many of those who stayed behind in the old country would have to rebuild their lives and homes after the war. It was not an easy time to be Polish. The country's eastern borders were not set until 1921. In the early post-war years, people continued to emigrate to the United States before limits were placed on immigration in 1919. 
Henceforth, it would be difficult to emigrate to the United States if Canada and Brazil were still popular options. And times continued to be tough. The economy faced many challenges. And among the peasants, there continued to be surplus population, now with nowhere to go. Villages vegetated, and people hardly eked out in existence. How much more fortunate were their relatives who made it to the United States? As one woman declared, after she had returned to Poland after spending time in the United States before the war, I quote, I would give up an eye to go to America. Their night is better than day here. Another reportedly went to America in search of a happier place on the earth than where her great-grandmother, grandmother, and mother cried through most of their lives. Now, those who went to the United States, of course, had to have money for their travels. Doubtless, many families borrowed so that a child could make the trip. In the case of entire families emigrating, they surely sold their property, land, and livestock to go. In the case of individuals escaping from unfortunate family circumstances, sometimes money could be taken surreptitiously from the family. Or siblings could borrow from siblings to enable a wave of immigration. Many incurred debts in this way that had to be repaid. To conclude, lives were hard back in the old country, either under foreign rule or in a struggling brand new state. Many Poles and others were used to hard work and did not fear it. Immigrants to the new world were willing to earn their keep even to scrimp and save and send money home. What many wa immigrants wanted was independence, the possibility of making decisions for themselves. They sought to escape from, the, from under the sometimes tyrannical control of parents or stepmother. They wanted to be able to control the money they made and decide their own future. Doubtless, some were fearless seekers of adventure, willing to take a risk in an unknown environment. Others joined someone from the family or from the same village who was already abroad. Whatever the reason, it is clear that the United States was a country where immigrants could find and make a place for themselves. The discrimination was not based on class but on the relative newness of a particular group of immigrants. I'm sure you know, all know about the waves of immigration that way. There's no time to go into this, but many a peasant learned that he or she was Polish, recall that they came from those three large empires, not from any country called Poland, once they arrived in the United States, where they would attend the same church and join the same clubs, for example, the Falcons, and socialized with people who spoke their language. That is how they became Polish Americans or other hyphenated Americans. So you see that the country we know as Poland had a complicated and trying history, even disappearing from the map of Europe for over a century. Its inhabitants were shaped not only by that loss, but by the country's division into three parts, each under a different empire. An understanding of the changes wrought over the course of the 19th century to the social structure, state organization, economic situation, and the treatment of minorities within Russia, Germany, and Austria-Hungary can help to explain why so many subjects of the empire saw fit to leave to emigrate to the New World, to the United States, and some ultimately to the Connecticut River Valley. Each empire treated its newly acquired territories and minority populations differently, which had ramifications for our ancestors. Again, the region's peasants were eventually emancipated, the last freed only as of 1864. But getting their freedom was not to be equated with getting everything they needed to thrive. There was land hunger, hunger for enough land so as to be able to feed their families. Many peasants struggled. This was true of townspeople 
and even nobles, albeit their troubles did not compare with that of the struggling peasant farmers literally trying to eke out a living. There were many superfluous people in the villages. Given these conditions, it should come as no surprise that many should look for a better life elsewhere. Many of you are the descendants of those intrepid individuals who did just that. And I thank you for your attention and for your patience today. Thank you.